Hello, and welcome to Shimatsu's Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography. This is session 7, where we'll be covering GC data processing. My name's Ollie Stacey, and I'll be your presenter for this session, and I'm part of the GC GCMS technical team for Shimatsu in the UK. We're getting towards the end of our series on the theory and key principles of GC. If you've missed any of the previous sessions, which cover the theory of GC and the various hardware components, I recommend you watch them and then sign up to the next available slot for this session. All previous sessions are available on demand and can be accessed from our website. In the remaining sessions, we'll be looking at maintenance, troubleshooting and method development for gas chromatography. In the last session, we looked at the different detectors available. So in this session, we're going to be looking at how we process the data they generate. Before we look at how the data is processed, I want to take a few minutes to look at the different sample and compound types that we typically encounter in GC analysis. So let's begin this session's technical content by looking at sample types. Obviously we have our samples themselves which are also referred to as unknowns. These samples contain a compound or compounds that we'd like more information about. That might be information on sample purity or knowing how much of a compound is in our sample. Or it could be determining if a compound is present or not, or what its concentration is relative to different compounds. In order to answer these questions, we need samples where the content is known. These are known as standards. They'll contain a known concentration of a target compound or compounds. If we want to calculate the concentration of analytes in our unknowns, we'll likely need a number of standards, each at different concentrations. In many regulated environments, you might also come across quality control or QC samples. These also have a known concentration in them. The difference with QCs is that we analyse them as if we don't know the amount, and then compare the reported concentration with the known concentration to determine whether or not the GC system is reporting within specification. QCs tend to be made from a blank matrix, where the target analytes are then spiked in to create a certain concentration. For example, in the analysis of pesticides in sediment, a sample of sediment, which is known to be free of pesticides, is spiked with a specific amount of pesticide so that it mimics the response of a real-world sample, rather than a clean solvent mixture containing pesticides. So how do all these sample types fit into a typical sequence for the analysis of a batch of samples? Well, to begin with, we typically run a blank or blanks to confirm the system is clean and ready for analysis. This is then followed by our standards, from low concentration to high concentration. If we ran from high to low, we run the risk of carryover, which would skew the results. After the standards, we might run a blank again, to make sure there's no carryover from our high level standard. If we're running QCs, these will then be run, followed by our samples. Every 10 or so samples, another QC might be analysed, followed by more samples and then at the end of the batch, a final QC is analysed. The purpose of bracketing our samples with QCs is because it's common to only accept sample results where the QCs either side of those samples have passed. If the QC either before or after that set of samples fails, those samples need to be rerun, as it's not known at what point the GC system fell out of specification. Within our samples, standards and QCs, we have a range of different compound types. We've touched on some of these previously, but there are some others you might not be so familiar with. Of course we have our target compounds. These are the compounds of analytical interest, and normally we want to know how much of a target is in our sample. The next type of compound, which we've also spoken about previously, is matrix. This is all other components within the sample that are not of analytical interest. But we need to be aware of matrix, as it can cause increased noise in our baseline, or even alter a target's response. In environmental analysis, 
matrix often boosts the response of some pesticides by blocking active sites in the inlet and column, which some pesticides get stuck on. One compound type which might be new to you is the internal standard. This is a compound or set of compounds that are spiked into prepared samples, standards and QCs. The purpose of the internal standard is to account for instrument variability. The internal standard is usually chemically similar to the target, such as xylene being used as an internal standard for benzene to ensure a similar response. And it should also have a similar retention time. Importantly, it can't be something that might be present in the sample, as this would impact the results. The amount added to every sample and standard is the same, or it needs to be known precisely and inputted into the data processing software. The final type of compound are surrogates. These compounds are spiked into a sample before any preparation is performed, and they are usually used to determine the recovery of target analytes during the sample preparation procedure. For this to be effective, the surrogate must be as chemically similar to the target as possible. As with the internal standard, the surrogate cannot already be present in the sample, and the amount spiked needs to be known. For GCMS analysis, internal standards and surrogates are often deuterated species of the targets, as this ensures they are not already present in the sample and are extremely chemically similar. For GC, it's almost impossible to differentiate between targets and their isotopically labelled equivalents, as we require retention time separation. Let's take fatty acid analysis as an example. The target components within this analysis are the fatty acids themselves, but it might be only a few that we're looking for, such as unsaturated C8, C10 and C12 acids. These molecules typically require derivatization prior to analysis. In this example, our matrix is going to be plant material. Selecting internal standards can be difficult for GC as it must fulfill all the requirements we mentioned previously. It must separate completely from all other components in the sample, but should be similar in retention time to the analytes. It needs to be chemically stable and should have similar properties to the target compound. Assuming there's no C11 fatty acid in our sample, we could use a commercially available C11 FAME reference standard. If not, we may need to consider something different, perhaps dodecane, for our surrogate, we would ideally use a deuterated C8 fatty acid. For GCFID, we might have to consider using an alternative fatty acid that isn't present in the sample. If this isn't the case, and information on recovery is required, GCMS might be the only viable option. So let's take a look at when we add our internal standard and surrogate in the sample preparation process. The first thing we need to do is to homogenize our sample if it's something like plant material. This might be using a bead mill, blender or pestle and mortar. We then need to dissolve the pulp in a suitable solvent and at this point, or possibly before, we add a known amount of surrogate to a known amount of sample. We then perform the derivatization via an esterification reaction to create a methyl ester of our fatty acid, or FAMES. Once this is done, we would typically extract our FAMES into a solvent that isn't miscible with the current solution. This could be a hexane extraction from water. We would then collect the organic phase. At this stage, we perform any necessary dilutions to ensure the concentration is suitable for the analyzer. A known amount of internal standard is then added to a known volume of sample, and the resulting mixture is transferred into a vial ready for injection into the GC system. Data acquisition then generates a data file or files for us to process. So at this point we need to decide what information do we want from our sample. The options we have are qualitative or quantitative analysis. Qualitative analysis looks to identify what's in a sample whilst quantitative analysis goes one step further 
and looks to determine how much of a compound is in a sample, or how pure it is. So let's start by taking a look at qualitative analysis. With GC detectors, we base identity on retention time alone. To identify a compound within a sample, we have to firstly run a standard containing that compound in order to determine the component's retention time. This is because, when analysed under the same conditions, a specific compound should always elute at the same time. So if we're looking to identify two components in a sample, we have to run standards containing those components. In this case, we run one standard containing compound A and a second standard containing compound B. Now when we analyse our unknown, we can look for a peak at the corresponding retention times to determine if compound A and B are present in the sample or not. It's worth noting we can't identify any other peaks in this sample. And there's one other issue with GC analysis. There will be multiple compounds that possess the same retention time as our analyte of interest. So we need a means of additional confirmation. If we have access to a GCMS, this can be used. If not, confirmation can be sought on a different column. The second column must offer a different retention time for compound A in order to offer greater confidence. In this case, a standard containing compound A is analysed on both column 1 and column 2. The unknown sample is then analysed on both columns and we look for a peak at the two different retention times. In this example, there is no peak on column 2 for the unknown sample, so we can be confident that, despite there being a peak at the right retention time on column 1, compound A is not present in this sample. In this example, because we observe a peak at the correct retention time on both columns, we can say with confidence that compound A is present in our unknown sample. But despite all of this, we can't yet provide any information on how much of compound A is present. To do this, we need to perform quantitative analysis on our sample. There are a number of ways in which we can quantify what's in our sample, and we're going to look at each of these four options. But one thing they all have in common is that they all rely on peak integration to determine the peak area. I'm not going to cover how to integrate a peak in this webinar because every software package has its own algorithm and set of terminologies and parameters that can be adjusted. Please refer to your software's manual for details on how integration is performed for your analysis. Having said this, however your software integrates, it's essential that you set the correct parameters to ensure your integration is correct. If your integration is incorrect, your results will also be incorrect. If you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So let's look at how we can use our correctly integrated peaks to quantify. We'll start by looking at the most simple way, area percent. Area percent is simply the area that your compound peak equates to relative to the total area of all peaks in the sample. In this example, Compound A has a peak area of 450, and the total area of all peaks in the chromatogram is 3000. So this results in a reported concentration for compound A of 15% of the sample. However, this method has some pretty big pitfalls. It assumes that all compounds have the same response factor, and that all compounds in your sample are detected, both by the detector and the software's integration. The advantage of the area percent method is that it doesn't require any standards to be analysed. But its biggest disadvantage is that it doesn't give definitive amounts and the assumptions made mean that it's not a well accepted method for robust quantitation. One way of improving its reliability is to use what's known as corrected area percent. In this variation, we divide the peak areas by the compound's relative response factors to account for the fact that some components give higher responses than others for the same quantity of compound. In this situation, the corrected area gives us a value of 24%. 
As I said, the only difference with this method is that we answer the assumption that all components have the same response. The other disadvantages of area percent also apply to corrected area percent. So we need to find a more robust method. So let's now look at a far more accepted method for quantitation and the method that is used most frequently, the external standard calibration method. In this method, we use the standards that we introduced at the start of this session. We refer to them as external standards to differentiate between the different types of standards available. In this case, they're external because they are separate to the unknown samples. We analyse them one after the other, starting from the lowest concentration. Once they're all run, it becomes clear that there's a correlation between the concentration of our compound and the peak area seen at the detector. We can plot these points on a graph of peak area against concentration. If we plot a line of best fit through the points, we can use this to calculate the concentration of compound A in any sample based on the calculated peak area. So in one sample, with a peak area of 5000, we can equate this to a concentration of 6.3 ppm. And for a peak area of 700, we can calculate that this sample contains 0.8 ppm of compound A. This method is much more robust than area percent, and is widely accepted as a reliable and robust method for quantitation. Using this method, we can determine exact quantities of compounds within the sample. But the method isn't completely without flaw. This version of the method doesn't account for any instrument variation, such as small discrepancies in injection volume. And it's much more labour intensive, as it requires the preparation of calibration standards. And you'd usually need a minimum of three concentrations to be confident your line of best fit is accurate. Ideally, you'd want to use around 5. If we include an internal standard with this method, we can improve the robustness and accuracy of our results. And as we said at the beginning, an internal standard is a compound which is spiked in the sample prior to analysis. So our external standard for compound A is run as normal, but it now includes an additional internal standard peak. And now, rather than plotting peak area against concentration, we plot area ratio, which is calculated by dividing the compound area by the internal standard area. This means that any differences in instrument response are accounted for. For example, if a second injection of the same standard had a small air bubble in the syringe, the system wouldn't inject a full 1 microliter of standard. This would give a lower peak area for compound A. But importantly, the peak area for our internal standard will also drop by the same relative amount. The end result is that the area ratio for both injections is the same. Internal standards are also useful if your detector requires frequent calibration, such as the SCD or FTD. As the detector response varies over time, the internal standard will keep the results consistent and comparable. So as I said, rather than plotting peak area, our calibration curve's y-axis is now area ratio. Our sample's area ratio can then be used to calculate the concentration in the same way as before. So this variation of the external standard calibration method therefore offers even greater robustness and provides even more accurate results by accounting for variability in instrument response. But it does require even more preparation as every sample and standard needs to be spiked with internal standard and it's imperative that the amount of internal standard is either consistent across all standards and samples or that the amount in each sample and standard is accurately known and reported in the software, so the calculations are performed correctly.
Where our sample preparation is more involved, such as requiring extraction or derivatization, there's even more room for error. In these cases, it's important we can calculate the recovery of the preparation method. It's imperative that this is determined during method validation, but it's also very strongly recommended that recovery is determined for all samples to check for any possible preparation errors. To calculate recovery, we use surrogate addition. Providing we know how much we added at the start of the sample preparation, we can calculate how much should be in our vial after any dilution steps during preparation. If, for example, we calculate the amount to be 1 ppm, but our GC reports a result of 0.7 ppm, that means our complete method, from plant to result, has a recovery of 70%. We can now divide the reported concentration in our samples by the recovery to back calculate the amount of compound A that was present in our original plant sample. As part of method development and validation, acceptable recovery amounts should be determined. So in this example, we can divide our result of 1.3 ppm by the recovery, which is 70%. And that then gives us a total concentration in the plant sample of 1.9 ppm of compound A. Hopefully the advantages of using surrogates is clear. It allows us to track losses during the sample preparation phase and can also help account for sensitivity changes due to things like matrix interference. The disadvantage is obviously that further sample preparation steps are required. It's also essential that the surrogate acts in the same way as your target analyte. The only way to guarantee this is to use isotopically labelled surrogates. But these are expensive, can be difficult to source, and tend not to be amenable for GC analysis, as you're more reliant on difference in mass. In some cases, it might be possible to chromatographically resolve the target and surrogate compounds, but more often than not, you'll find yourself needing a GCMS for this analysis. There's one final quantitation method, which isn't particularly common, but is quite often used for headspace analysis, and that's standard addition. You'll remember from my webinar on sampling techniques that the concentration of analytes in the headspace is affected by the sample matrix. And you'll remember that headspace is often used for a wide range of samples, including liquids that aren't amenable to liquid injection. Let's take wastewater as an example. The makeup of these samples is going to vary significantly from sample to sample. If we were to run a calibration set in clean water and then analyse samples, we're running samples with a completely different matrix to our standards. So we have to use the standard addition technique in order to account for the impact sample matrix has on sensitivity. Standard addition does what it says on the tin. We add standard to our samples. So what we do is take multiple vials containing the same sample, and we then spike standard at different concentrations into each sample. In this example, we have to take five vials of our sample. The first is injected with a blank, and the remaining four are injected with different concentrations of our standard solution. We now know that each of our samples has the same unknown amount of compound A in each, plus an additional known amount of compound A, which is different in each vial. Now when we plot our calibration curve, we can calculate the unknown amount of compound A based on the x-axis intercept. So standard addition is good for certain applications, as it takes into account the impact matrix has on the results. And you can also include an internal standard to improve robustness even further. But it's extremely labour intensive. Assuming a four point calibration curve, every sample requires five vials to be prepared. It's not only labour intensive, but also instrument time intensive, and severely impacts the number of samples that can be analysed every day. We've spoken about calibration curves a lot in the last 20 minutes or so. 
I've already said how important it is that your integration is correct. Well, the same is true for your calibration curve, as an incorrect curve will generate incorrect results. So let's have a look at some of the common curve parameters and properties. One of the most important characteristics of any calibration curve is how accurately it represents our data points. The most commonly known parameter in quantitative analytical chemistry is the coefficient of determination, which is more commonly known as R squared. A value of 1 represents a perfect representation of our data, where the curve passes through each data point exactly. But this isn't always achievable. As our data line of best fit stops passing through the data points, the R squared value drops away from 1, all the way down to 0, where there's absolutely no correlation in the data. Methods will typically have a specific R squared value that needs to be achieved in order for the calibration to be valid, such as 0 0.995 or 0 0.997. In terms of curve fitting parameters, the first one is the shape of our curve. Now ironically, in most methods, we use a linear curve, so it's not a curve at all. But we can also have an actual curve, such as a quadratic curve, which is common in specific applications, or with detectors like the FPD when quantifying sulphur. Other curve fits are also possible, such as point to point, although these are less commonly used. Another parameter which can have a significant impact on the curve is whether or not the line of best fit passes through the origin. In most software packages, the origin can either be ignored, in which case the curve will fit to give the best R squared, or we can force it through the origin, which might be specified in some regulatory methods. Another important parameter that's often overlooked is weighting. Now this parameter isn't particularly easy to explain without complex mathematical equations, but I'm going to do my best. With no weighting, the curve fit is more heavily impacted by data points for higher concentrations. This can result in the curve deviating significantly at the lower end, meaning that samples with low concentrations can report incorrect results. If we apply a weighting, such as 1 over concentration, or 1 over concentration squared, the curve will be more heavily influenced by data points for lower concentrations. This might reduce your R squared value, but it tends to make the reported results at lower concentration ranges more accurate. Like I said, many people overlook this, and don't apply any weighting at all. Usually, the only time this is done is when it's specified in a prescribed method. So there we have it. Hopefully this has provided a useful insight into how we get from a peak on a chromatogram to a quantity. We've looked at the different types of samples, including unknowns, standards and QCs. We've also covered the different types of compounds, including targets and matrix, which are present in our sample. Internal standards are added after sample preparation to correct for instrument variation, while surrogates are added before sample preparation to determine recovery. Qualitative analysis is used to tell us what's in the sample, whilst quantitative analysis answers the question, how much is there? There are a range of quantitative methods, including area percent, external standard and standard addition. And finally, we looked at the properties and parameters of calibration curves, such as the coefficient of determination, or R squared. The next session will be on maintenance and troubleshooting, where we'll cover inlet maintenance, column installation and maintenance, and detector maintenance. And we'll also look at some of the most common troubleshooting issues and how to solve them. If you'd like to receive the latest news from Shimadzu UK, including information on webinars, workshops and events, please join our newsletter by going to our website. If you'd like to get in contact with us, the contact details for UK attendees are on screen now. For those joining from outside the UK, 
You can find contact details for your local Shimadu office by going to Shimadu's Global Analytical website. That's all from me for this session. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of your day. Excellence in Science, Shimazu.